everybody get out in it at least for a few minutes? How many of you got out in a couple of hours of it? Yeah, I had a feeling you guys probably would over there. Oh, man, it was beautiful. What a day. There was a, so funny, uh, at the lake that we're near, that we're located at our house, all the boats are off. They've already, you know, stored them, but there's one guy, and he was out there today going around and round and round and just enjoying himself. He was going while we left even. An hour later, he's still going around the lake and making me, making me laugh away. But he was enjoying so God is good. We have a special presentation. I'll let you go ahead and do that, and then we'll have prayer and announce the subjects. So, who's attended for ten nights? Isn't that amazing? We have someone who's attended for ten nights, and so what we have here is a study Bible signed by myself with a, one of my favorite verses. Amen. It's got a lot of awesome maps and different things, but at this time, I like to call Ahi to the front to collect your free Bible. <laughs> or you can go meet, you can meet her over <laughs> yes. there if we want. We won't have her get up. <laughs> yes. This so is congratulations, Ahi. Congratulations. Yes. We know you're enjoying, but I, that's okay. <laughs> You never know. Sometimes when this one has extra helps, the commentaries in there are really, really special, and they're they're spot on with. Uh, yes, they've got the reference text and some uh, extras on the back. You'll enjoy that. Even if you use it as a reference Bible and look up those extra helps, you, it, it's really powerful. So, blessings to you. We're grateful. Grateful. <laughs> oh, well, t- tonight we have a desolate planet, and uh, after we pray, Danny will share uh, what's up and coming. Now, tomorrow night, I do remember, tomorrow night is God's Strange Act. Now, this is a really fascinating one, God's Strange Act. There's something that is foreign or strange to his character, and uh, we've uh, mentioned a little bit about what that is. That is dealing with the subject of the hellfire. So that'll be uh, interesting as well. These are, these are such a blessing. Danny, thank you for letting God use you and uh, finding the energy, you know, night after night to come and present by the grace of God. So let's go ahead and we will have a prayer and we'll let Danny bring us tonight's message. Our kind Father in heaven, we're so grateful for the beautiful day that you've given us, Lord. It's amazing it was amazing weather still is, a beautiful evening. We see the moon is growing, waxing and larger in the sky in the middle of the night. And still with some of those shooting meteorites. Lord, we're just so grateful to see the signs that there is a God in heaven. A God who is watching over what's going on in this world. A God who loves us. So, Father, we want to turn over tonight to you. We want to give our brother Danny to you and ask for you to... Uh, Lord, lift him up and energize him, and uh, Lord, it's a solemn topic, uh, one of excitement in one aspect and one that is more solemn on another, and so Lord, as we listen, may we gain, may we understand truth, fill us with your spirit, prepare our hearts to receive, thus says the Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening to each and every single one of you, welcome back. I have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we're back here again for another night. We're very excited about that. And I see some people that I haven't seen in a while. Good to see you guys. The bad news is I went home the other night and I took with me my clicker. I took my clicker with me. And so what that means is I won't be able to walk around as much as I like to do, but we're still going to have a great evening. So uh, tonight's subject is a desolate planet. Tonight's subject is a desolate planet. We're going to be examining a passage in the Bible that predicts a moment in time when the planet is empty and there's virtually no one on the planet. It's uninhabited. And then 
not tomorrow evening. Tomorrow evening we have off. But the following evening, Friday, we're going to look at God's strange act. We're going to examine one of the most misunderstood texts in the Bible. We're going to see how could a loving God do something like this? What is it all about? Yeah. Today is Tuesday. So tomorrow, you're going to want to come. You're going to want to be here on, on Wednesday. Wow, time is just uh, it's flying here. It's Tuesday. You're going to want to be here on Wednesday to listen to this message. And then on Friday, you're going to come and you're going to listen to how to postpone your funeral. How many of you guys want to live an extra 10 years? I love to, to live an extra 10 years. We're going to talk about how you can do that according to the Bible. What are some lifestyle tips that allow you to live longer? That's what we want to look at on Friday evening. But let's have a word of prayer, and then we're going to dive right into our subject this evening. Dearly Father, I just want to thank you so much for this day, and Lord, for the beautiful sunlight that you've shared with us, and the time that we had to be outside and experience that. Lord, I just ask that you would send your Holy Spirit to help us as we study your word this evening. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. A desolate planet. So you can search the Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation, and you won't find the term millennium. It's very interesting. You hear millennium in reference to Bible prophecy all the time, but you'd be surprised to know it's actually not in the Bible. But what you do, do see in the Bible is what the term millennium means, which is a thousand years. So let's go ahead and turn in our Bibles to Revelation. We're going to start in chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we're going to look at verse 7. Revelation 20, verse 7. The Bible says, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of what? His prison. And will go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth. Gog and Magog. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. Bible prophecy mentions a, a thousand year period and it says that after this thousand year period, Satan will be loosed. What does that mean? What does the Bible mean when it says that after this, this thousand years, Satan will be loosed? Tonight I want to go and, and look at a Bible promise that we looked at a couple of nights ago. And we're going to review this. John chapter 14, 1 through 3. The Bible says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in who? In me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, what? There you may be also. Let's think about what we just read. Where is God, or where did Jesus go? He went to heaven to where his father was. And what is he doing? He's preparing a place for us in heaven. And when do we get to go? Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 15. First of Thessalonians, one of those small books in the back of your Bible that takes forever to get to. First Thessalonians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 15. It says here, For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain um, shall, until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Continuing on, for the Lord himself will do what? Descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Notice here how we go up to meet the Lord in the air. He doesn't actually come down and touch his feet on the earth. Not yet at least. The graves are opened. We get our our glorified bodies. Now here's something that I want us to think about. A question that I want us to ask. When we finally get to heaven, what do you think we're going to be doing? Now, there's a lot of theories on what we're going to be doing when we're in heaven. Some say that we're going to be on a a cloud stroking a a harp, strumming a harp. And uh, that sounds like a pretty boring existence to me. For thousands of years, maybe you could do that for the first maybe 100 years, get some new tunes out. But after that, I think that would be quite boring. So what are we going to do? What does the Bible say we are going to do in heaven? Look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Do you not know that the saints will do what? Judge the world. Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now this is really interesting because the Bible is saying here, that you and I are the ones who are going to be judging when we're in heaven. Interesting. Not only does it say that, it says that we are going to be judging angels. We're going to be judging angels. God opens the books and he says, come take a look. See if I haven't been fair. See if I haven't been just. That's what he's saying in this text. Come and take a look at what my judgments are. Look at what the book of Revelation says. Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and what was committed to them? Judgment was committed to them, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how many years? A thousand years. It says we're going to live and reign with Christ for a thousand years, and during that time, we're going to be judging. And here's what it says just a few verses later. Turn in to Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12. We're going to see something interesting. It says, And I saw the dead, both small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and the books, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their what? According to their works. Now I want us to pay attention to what it says here. You and I are going to judge who? Angels, fallen angels, as well as, according to this verse, the dead. You and I will judge people who did not come up when Jesus came and and resurrected all of his righteous people. You and I are going to be opening those books and reviewing their lives. And also the angels who are not in the kingdom. It appears that God is is letting us see the the whole book, seeing people's lives, and he's actually putting himself on trial. He's saying, you know what? Maybe I haven't been fair, but go and take a look. You will see that I am indeed fair. You will see that I am indeed just. You are just. And when we come to the end, we're going to say, you know what? You're right. You're right. Your judgments are true. They are fair. God's not afraid to have us take a look. He's not trying to hide anything. He's saying, come look. Come open up the books and judge with me. And here's what we eventually say when we turn to Revelation 15, verse 3 and 4. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are whose works? Your works, Lord God. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. For all the nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. What's the conclusion? Every decision that God made was right. Every decision that we right now may not have thought was a good decision by God, we'll see, oh, That's why you did that. That's why you constructed my life in this way. 
This is why you allow this to happen to me because of this big picture that I'm now able to see. The conclusion that we come to is we won't change a single thing. Now, let's slow down a little bit, and we're going to look at how exactly this is going to work. The first group of people that we saw is described in Isaiah chapter 25. So let's turn there in our Bibles. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 9. Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 9. The Bible says, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will do what? He will save us. This is our Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. These are people who are glad that Jesus has come. They are sick and tired of all the mess and sadness and pain that is here on this earth. They're saying, Lord, I am happy to see you. I know that you've died for my sins and I've accepted your free gift of salvation and you're finally here after so many years. But there's another group that's described in the Bible. A very sad portion of the Bible. Revelation chapter 6. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains, what did they say? Fall on us. Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. These are the people who aren't ready. These are the people who have been given a chance. People who have been shown the gospel. You can have this. It can be yours. But they simply decided to reject it. They don't have faith in Jesus. So what happens to these people? Listen very carefully. Turn to Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. And we're going to see what a sharp sword is representing here. Revelation 19 verse 15. The Bible says, And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that it, with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of God. So, the question is, what is a sword representing here? Well, if you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, it says that God's word is as sharp as a two-edged sword. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 6, it calls God's word the sword of the spirit. Jesus comes back, and there's a sword in his mouth. And why is this the case? It's the case because on that day when he comes back, the question is, What did God say? What did God say? It's not what did I say. It's not what you said. It's not what your favorite preacher said. But rather, what did God say? That's always been the issue from the very moment that we sin. Do you really think you're going to die if you eat this fruit? You're not really going to die. It's not how it works. That day that Jesus comes is not only going to be a matter of what other people said. The only thing that matters is what did Jesus say in the Bible. Listen to what happens next here. <clears throat> and the rest were killed with a sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. What's so unfortunate about this is that it doesn't have to be this way. Anybody and everybody can be saved. These people have simply chosen not to follow the lamb wherever he he went. These are people who have been left in their sins, and when they see Jesus, sin can't stand in the presence of a perfect God, and so they they die. They've left their man, they they've been left with their man-made designer religion. They've decided to choose their own things, they've decided to craft their own paths. So if you think about it, you have four groups of people then. You have, number one, the righteous living. They're taken to heaven as soon as Jesus comes. Number two, you have the righteous dead who are resurrected and also taken. Then you have the the wicked who are living and they're slain when Jesus comes. And then you have the wicked dead who stay dead when Jesus comes. 
very interesting. Now, here's a question. How many people are alive on earth after Jesus comes? That's a great question. Who is alive on this earth? There's absolutely nobody left on this earth after this happens. Either you have the righteous, as we saw in those four groups, who are in heaven, the righteous dead and the righteous living, and you have the, the wicked dead who are in the grave, and you have the wicked living who, were di who died. <clears throat> nobody is left on earth. And that's why the Bible says it is desolate. Jeremiah chapter 4 says this, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without what? Form and void. In the heavens they had no light. This is the original word. It comes from, I want to get this right for you guys, Septuagint. It's the, old, it's the Greek version of the Old Testament. And that word, form and void, and what it's talking about here is Abusos, or the abyss, where we get the word abyss from, the bottomless pit. Sounds like creation, but let's read the whole thing. Continuing on, turn there to Jeremiah 4. We're going to continue reading this passage here. Jeremiah chapter 4, 23 to 27. The Bible says here, I beheld, in verse 24, and lo, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and lo, uh, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down in the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. For thus the Lord has said, the whole land shall be what? Yet will I not make a full end. Spiritual Babylon has, has come to an end. All this suffering is done. There's a true end. Everything is over. But notice what the Bible says here. It says, yet I will not make a what? A full end. Interesting. Because God takes us, us righteous, up to heaven, and you and I get to read the books. It's not over. He doesn't bring his kingdom back to the new earth until we've opened the books, read and judged, and then he comes back. And he lays out his kingdom here on earth, and he creates the new earth. In the meantime, the wicked are dead, and their bodies are right here on this earth. Listen to what it says in Isaiah. It shall come to pass in that day... That the Lord will punish on high the host of who? The exalted ones, and on the earth the kings of the earth. They will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and will be shut up in the prison after many days. They will be punished. The Bible says the, the wicked are gathered together in the pit, or that same word that we saw earlier, abusos, or the abyss. Interesting. The wicked are finally punished after the Bible says many days. And that's because you and I are going to be in heaven opening up those books and looking through. What did John do? Interesting. Lord, you were fair in this situation. What did so and such angel do? You were certainly fair in that situation as well. Who's left on this planet? Absolutely nobody, but there is an exception. Look at Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah is right before Jeremiah. Isaiah chapter 14. We're going to look at verse 20. Isaiah 14 verse 20, it says, Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain your people. Lucifer doesn't die yet. Not yet. He has to sit on this broken planet and realize the pain and suffering that he's caused. No one's there to tempt, no one's there to control, no one's there to, to rile them up and have them hurl insults at God. They're all dead, and he has to be there with his own mind. He's chained up, metaphorically speaking. It's over for him. And you, you have to wonder what he might be thinking. 
as he's walking and pacing a, around the planet with no one left to tempt. And he's going over his, his record, his history, his career as Satan. And as he's kicking through the dirt, he sees a guy who he knew very well. A guy who he convinced to, to turn away from Christ and to follow his own path. And you know what he does? He smiles. He says, I did that. That was my work. He sees another, another lady. He kicks up the dirt and he sees this lady. She, he says, I did that. But then, guess what? He sees perhaps you, if you've chosen to follow Christ and the Lamb, or maybe anyone who's in heaven. He sees them and he realizes that he didn't conquer how he thought he conquered. He lost. And you and I are in heaven, judging those fallen angels. That person is living and reigning with Jesus as this is happening. And he's, he's thinking to himself, can't be. This isn't possible. He goes to jail for a thousand years. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. We're going to look at verse 1 through 3. We're going to spend a lot of time here in Revelation. Revelation 20, 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key to what? The bottomless pits. And a great chain was in his hand. That's that word again, the bottomless pit, abusos. The world that's broken down after Jesus comes. Continuing on. He laid hold of the dragon and cast him down and shut him up. That old serpent which is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should not do what? Deceive the nations. Interesting. Deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for how long? Just a little season. Just a small season. He's locked up on this planet. And how is he locked up? Because there's no one to tempt. There's no one to, to get to, to follow him. He's all by himself with his fallen creatures along with him. This only lasts for a thousand years. And we're reading the books of heaven, we're opening up and we're judging while that thousand year reign is going on. And then the Bible says that he's released for a little while. How is Satan released? That's a great question. If he was chained up because there's nobody left to tempt and to rally together to worship him, then being loosed must mean the wicked come back. And I'll show you that in a moment. Well, let's pause and review what we've seen so far. So right now we have the second coming. Jesus comes back in the clouds, right? You have the first resurrection, the resurrection of the righteous. They're raised up and they go to meet God in the air. And they go up to heaven and then the wicked are slain. They go into the dust and they rest. And then there's a thousand year period where, where the righteous are doing what? They're examining the books. They're judging the fallen angels, and the wicked dead. And then the devil is bound up for that period because there's no one on earth to tempt. But the question is, what happens after this 1,000-year period? I'm going to show you an amazing sequence of events because the Bible says that you and I don't stay in heaven for this after this 1,000-year period. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. Blessed are the meek, for they shall do what? Inherit the earth. So when does that happen? At the end of the thousand years. We come back here to this earth. Then I, John, saw the holy city. Revelation chapter 21. I saw the holy city in verse 2. New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. The world, this world has always been our home. At least we call it our home. It's not really our home. It's a place that God created for us to live, but it's been degraded and broken down, and so much pain and suffering is now here. It's no longer a home. It's more like a, a slum, a, a ghetto. 
So the Bible says Jesus came. He became the second Adam. He took back control from Satan. He said, no, this is my planet. This planet belongs to me. And after the thousand years, God comes back and he fixes this planet and we get to move in. It's the only point where Jesus actually touches the ground. Look at Zechariah chapter 14 and verse 4. In that day, his feet will stand where? On the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west. In the Bible, feet are a symbol of ownership, and that's why God told Abraham, wherever you you walk, that I will give you. That land I will give unto you. In Genesis chapter 13, you can see that story. When Jesus comes to get us, his feet don't touch the ground. Not until we've opened up the books and we've finished our judging. And he says, now this planet, I own it and you own it as well. Come and own this planet together with me. And we openly declare that Jesus deserves the kingdom. In that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move towards where? The north, and half of it towards the south. He touches the, the ground, and the mountain splits in half, making room for the new Jerusalem to come down out of heaven and touch down between this chasm, the new Jerusalem. It's very big. It's got a lot of room for us. Turn to Revelation chapter 21, verse 16. Revelation 21, 16. And the city lieth four square, and the length is as large as its breadth. And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length and breadth and height are equal. Do you know how long a furlong is? I never figured this out until recently. How many furlongs? 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 square miles. That's about 375 miles per side. That's a massive city, and guess what? It's all for each and every single one of us. I am so excited to be able to be there. It's a permanent capital of the world, and Jesus is going to be the king and the savior. He's going to reign there forever. And we don't have to worry about any more elections. Amen? No more elections. No more Democrat, Republican nonsense. But just Jesus. Jesus is here. We will never be apart from him ever again. Now let's look at what we have. So like I, I said earlier, we have the second coming. Jesus comes, the righteous Come up with him, the dead and the alive. You have the righteous going up to him. And you have the wicked who are slain. And then the ones who are dead, they stay in the grave. You have the thousand-year period. The devil is bound. Then the righteous are examining the books, judging with God. And God is allowing himself to be placed on trial during that time. See if I am just. See if I am true. And then what happens after this period? The city comes down. And then you have the second resurrection. The second resurrection. What is the second resurrection? Turn to Revelation chapter 20, verse 5. Revelation 20 and verse 5. The Bible says, But the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is what? The first resurrection. Interesting. This is the moment when the wicked finally come back to life. They are raised from the dead, and it's interesting what they do. They don't realize how they've messed up. They don't ask for repentance and forgiveness. That's not what they do. But instead, they decide to, to surround the camp. Maybe we can still take the city. Maybe we can have this glory, and, and Satan will, will allow us to do what we want, is what they say. There's a glimmer of hope in their minds. Revelation 27 through 9. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from where? His prison. And he will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, 
to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sand of the sea. Jesus is coming and the lamb has come and Satan has been fully exposed for who he is, the liar and the murderer that he is. And the wicked see it. They see the pain and suffering that's been caused to their own lives. And yet they still choose to follow the dragon. It'll be pain, painfully obvious that everyone's decision is final. He that is just, let him be just still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. The, the, the decisions are final. And if you weren't convinced by the books, by what you saw, what Jesus showed you, you will be convinced because they are showing you that the decision is final. That they've decided to choose against the lamb. Look, I'll bring them back for just a moment, and you'll get to see how they act, how they respond. Revelation, continuing on in, in verse 7 through 9, the Bible says here, They went on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city, and fire came down from heaven and devoured them. These people have ignored God's voice. They've chosen against following the lamb, and this is what they choose. They still think that they can take the world by force, and God, out of mercy, puts them out of their misery. So this is what we have. The second coming, first resurrection, righteous in heaven, the wicked slain, this thousand-year period. The city comes down between the Mount of Olives, which is split. It's a 1,500-square-mile city, large enough to, to house all of us. You have the second resurrection. The wicked are destroyed after they try and take the city by force. And then what happens? A new earth. He recreates the earth. This earth that was so messed up, so broken, so desolate. He remakes it. Revelation 21 verse 1. Turn there in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. This is such a beautiful, beautiful verse. And I saw a new heaven and a what? A new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. There's going to be a new earth. We're going to see God create. God created and spoke things into existence in the beginning, and you're going to get to see him do it again. This is our future. This is where God's taking us. He's not taking us to, to sit on clouds for the rest of eternity. He's taking us to a beautiful place where we can inhabit and spend time with Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered or come to mind. Isn't that so amazing? This, this planet, how many of you guys want to forget the things that you've experienced in your life? I know I want to forget a lot of the experiences in my life. I want a fresh start. We're going to be so, so amazed with the, the new place that God has created for us that we're going to not even remember the old pain and, and troubles and trials that we went through. The big question is, what is the new world going to be like? And you'd be surprised how much the Bible describes this new earth. Revelation 22, 1 through 4. Just a page over in your Bibles. Revelation chapter 22, 1 through 4. And he showed me a pure river of water, the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and out of the Lamb. In the middle of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more what? No more curse. But the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. 
They shall see his face, and his name shall be on their foreheads. God's character will be in their hearts and in their minds. I'm so excited for that day. You and I are going to be there. Listen to what it says here in Isaiah chapter 35. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice, and the blossom and the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice. Can you imagine looking over the Sahara Desert and suddenly roses and blossoms are coming up all over the place? That's going to be incredible. No more hunger, no more famine, no more disease, none of these things, it's all done. Even with joy and singing, the revelation or the glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are fearful, are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not, behold your God. I remember, this was just a couple of years ago, my, uh, my mom, she found out that she had a cyst on her brainstem. A cyst on her brainstem. And she went to the hospital and she would have these random tremors and she couldn't even get out of bed by herself. And I had to experience this, be by her bedside and see my mom go through this horrible pain and, and not being able to do anything for herself. And family and friends were flying in to try and support. And it hit me. Wow, I want this, this world to be over. I want all this grossness and, and sin and all that it's caused, I want it to be done. I want it to be gone. I want perfection. I want to be with Jesus. That's what I want. Be strong. Fear not. Encourage those who are weak. Behold your God. He's coming with a vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He will come and he will do what? He will come and save you. Wait a minute, God's angry? Of course he's angry. Satan has been destroying this planet. He's been messing with his, his beloved creatures and he's angry. He says, I'm coming with vengeance. Even God with a recompense. He's coming to, to set the record straight. He says, no more. No more shall this take place. No more. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart or as a deer, and the tongue of the dumb will sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and the streams in the desert. I don't know if you've ever seen a deer hop a fence. I used to live in South Dakota, and uh, we had a, a garden plot there, and we had these deer. They would jump so very high to get into our garden. They, they wanted our tomatoes or something. I don't, I don't know what they wanted, but it was about a 10-foot tall fence, and they would still jump it. What does it say here? It says the lame man will leap as in heart. Friends, when we're in heaven, I'm going to put a fence right around my house so that you guys can see me jump over it just for fun. Just for fun. Just experiencing the joy and the happiness of heaven. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. How many of you guys have seen a wolf and a lamb feed together? I've never seen that. The lion shall eat straw like the bullock, and dust shall be the serpent's meat. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says who? Says the Lord. Imagine a, a world where you can send your kids outside to play by themselves. Just go have fun. Go explore. A, a world where you don't have to be worried about self-defense and, and all these other things that we worry about on a daily basis. But that's just the beginning. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. And they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit the, the fruit of your labor, you will get to enjoy that yourself. You will get to, to live in the house that you build, eat the fruit that you picked. It's not going to a grocery store 
5,000 miles away. You can pick it off and eat it. We're, we're going to work, you ask? Yes, but it's going to be completely different. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall do what? Long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth for trouble, for they are the seed of the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. Nobody's going to be ripping us off for our labor. Nobody's going to be doing any of these things because we're in heaven, and it doesn't matter. There's, there's unlimited resources. You can do as much as you want. And the best part is not the things that we're going to receive in heaven, but it's who we're going to be with. It's going to be Jesus. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21, 1 through 5. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice, a great voice from heaven, saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and, and they shall be his people. God himself will be there, and he shall wipe away the tears of their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat on the, th on the throne said, Behold, I make all things what? New. And he said unto me, Write these words, for these words are true and faithful. God is saying to us, You know what? All these things are going to happen, but not only that, they're faithful and they're true. You can count on me. I don't know if you're counting on something right now. I don't know if maybe you're counting on your next paycheck to come in. I know I'm counting on that. I don't know if you're counting on a relative that you'd like to see this holiday season. But you never know. These things might fall through. Just the way the world works sometimes. But God is saying, these things are faithful and true. You can take this to the bank. You can take this one home. Let's go ahead and... and and pray this evening, if this is your desire to, to be a part of this faithful group that is in heaven and is opening the books, just stand with me as we pray this evening. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your promises and your word and how, Lord, you've showed us so much. You've given us a, a foundation where we can base our faith off of. Lord, I'm asking that you would Help us to, to choose you on a daily basis, Lord. We, we know that temptation comes at us left and right, but we know that you can help us withstand temptation. Lord, and when, if we fall, Lord, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins if we only come and repent to you, Lord. I ask that you would be with us, Lord. Help us to internalize your words from your Bible and Give us safe traveling mercies this evening in Jesus' name. Amen.